Good evening, everyone. As you can see, our church is really busy with shifting to a new premise. We also have a curtain that separates us from the holy place and the a bit messy place behind the curtain. But it's also just nice that as we are uh, reading and learning from the book of Exodus, we are also reading about the Israelites also building a new tabernacle for their Lord and our Lord. And so uh, if you recall, the last time we were on the book of Exodus, it was last year, the, fir- the final service of last year, 31st December. And back then, when we were looking at the Exodus chapter, we talked about consecrating our lives to God. And I believe that should be our attitude as we begin this 2024 because this whole year we should have we should start correctly and blessedly with this heart that for the rest of no matter how we fare last year, no matter how we feel we have done right or not right enough before God, this year we our prayer should at least be God, I want to consecrate our life, my life to you so that this year we will live in favor of God. And it happens to tie in with uh, the church theme that Pastor has set for us this year. If you recall, for the English service, Pastor has said that our church theme this year is to live our life now in light of our next life. And so the wisest thing to live if we truly believe in eternity. If eternity is true, if God is real, if there's really a heaven, and if there's really rewards awaiting us, then the best way to live our life is to commit our lives to God and let our everyday today count toward eternity. And as for today, later on, when you read through the book of Exodus, you may feel as if uh, we are reading through a series of miscellaneous topics. You know, you will read about different, different things like prayer. We will read about atonement. We will read about cleansing, washing, and we will talk about being set apart. So all these themes may feel as if it's a combination of various miscellaneous topics. But what is the common thread that ties all these things together? And in sum, all these things, whether you're talking about being uh, praying in the right way, or whether you're talking about atonement, or whether we are talking about cleansing ourselves and setting ourselves apart, all this can be summed up to being pleasing and acceptable to God. So that our worship to God, our prayers, our life, and our, our living can be a sweet aroma to God. So today we will start first by looking at this thing that we will read from Exodus chapter 30, this altar of incense. So let's read, uh, let's look at Exodus chapter 30 from verse 1 to 10 first. So Exodus chapter one, uh, chapter 30, verse 1, make an altar of acacia wood for burning incense. Then later we jump to verse 6. Put the altar in front of the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant Law before the atonement cover that is over the tablets of the Covenant Law where I will meet you. So this altar of incense, why is it so important? Because it's very, very near the presence of God which is, which is tied to the Ark of the Covenant. And here God reminds his people again about what is the important thing. I will meet you there in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, when God reminds his people that he wants to meet them, he's expressing God's desire that he wants to be near his people. He got, God wants to be intimate with you and I. So God gave this timely reminder that while amidst all your busyness trying to build the tabernacle, you know, amidst all the uh, tedious sounding commandments about uh, the instructions of how to build the altar, how to build, how to stitch the curtains together, amidst all God's commands, God wants us to realize that His instructions is never for no reason. His instructions sometimes may sound a bit tedious, but ultimately, God desires to meet with us. God's instructions are all targeted toward drawing us close to Him. So God wants to meet with His people. And verse 7, Aaron must burn fragrant incense on the altar every morning when he tends the lambs, and he must burn incense again when he lights the lambs at twilight. So incense will burn regularly before the Lord for the generations to come. Now here, something very important for us to note is, is what? Every morning and every twilight, meaning every evening. So actually, three things happen back then, every morning and every evening. What are, they, they have to do three things. Every morning, every evening, the Israelites, they, will have, they have to sacrifice one lamb 
And that's what we read, if you forgot, we read that in Exodus chapter 29. And every morning and every evening, the Israelites also, as we, read, as we read here, the priests have to light the incense every morning, every evening. And also, the priests, as we read in Exodus chapter 27, if, in case you forgot, the priests also have to uh, ensure that the lambs within that tabernacle is being tended to. Now, so what does all this highlight, highlight for us? It highlights for us that the worship of God, because every of the three things have its significance, like the sacrifice of the lamb every morning and evening. It wants to remind us of the necessity of atonement for us to draw near to God. And then the incense, later we talk about the incense is uh, similar to prayer, prayer that were lifted up to God. And also the lambs, it represents the presence of God. All day long, whether it's in the morning when you wake up and go to work or at night when you know, you're about to rest, we need to remember that God's light is ever burning. God's presence is ever with us and we need His light all day long. So the worship of God, the remembering of God's covenant and His atonement and His presence, even the prayers given to God are not meant only for emergency moments. Oh, I have some crisis. I really need God's help suddenly to deal with an emergency. Oh, then I come to God's temple. I come to church to approach God. No, God is trying to tell us that worshipping Him is supposed to be a daily thing. It's not just once daily. It should be throughout, from morning to evening. So it's not like telling God, Oh God, thank you for saving my soul. Or thank you God for leading, leading us out of the Red Sea. Uh, now, uh, we will just meet you in heaven next time and we will carry on with our life without remembering God. No, that shouldn't be the case of a healthy Christian living. So just from simple instructions that we read from the Old Testament, we already can see God's uh, heartbeat and we already, already can draw some blessed principles even for our present day life. Now, verse 9, here it says, Do not offer on this altar of incense, any other incense. Now, I want to pause on this any other because this any other incense, um, it has a lot of, it has a variety of translations across different Bible versions. So when we look at King James Version, any other incense is translated as strange incense. You just note, you just note this first. Later on, I'll explain a little bit more. And then, um, because when we look at the root Hebrew word for this any other, the root word actually means to be a stranger. So, but in order to fit, fit this into the text, you cannot say uh, to be a stranger in sense. So, uh, God is trying to tell us to not offer any other or any strange incense, or it can be translated also as unauthorized. The ESV version says unauthorized. Now, unauthorized means what? Not commanded by God not by our whims and fancies. In another translation, any other is translated as do not offer unholy incense. So in other words, we need to worship God on the terms that he set. If God says you need to worship me, set aside one day a, one day a week, it's not you know, according to our terms, but God's terms. So here, do not offer do not offer on this altar any other incense or any burnt offering or grain offering and do not pour a drink offering on it. So God's commands are meant to be taken seriously. I mean, for some of you who are quite familiar with the Bible, you will recall Aaron's sons, they were the one who offered strange, strange offering to God. And then uh, that was recorded in Leviticus chapter 10. You know, they actually brought their senses and then they added incense which were unauthorized which is also strange to God. And so what happens? Fire came from God and consumed them and they were dead. So God's commands are not to be taken lightly. Then verse 10. Once a year, Adrian shall make atonement on its horns. This annual atonement must be made with the blood of the atoning sin offering for the generations to come. It is most holy to the Lord. Now, so here we are reading about what? The altar of, of what? Of incense. But if you recall, when we talk about the tabernacle, there is another altar that we have shared before. Actually, I'm not sure how many of you, in fact, remember the contents that we uh, went through concerning this portion of Exodus. Now, if I ask you about Red Sea, about the 10 plagues, maybe you can still name one or two. But 
when we talk about the tabernacles and its furnishings and furnitures, maybe we don't really have much an idea. But today, I want to uh, draw their significance as we share. So another altar in, within the tabernacle that we have shared before is the altar of burnt offering. And we have covered that when we shared on Exodus chapter 27. Now, to recap all our memories, let's look again at the, at the tabernacle layout. When you look at the picture, maybe it's easier to recall. So now when you look at the picture, which altar comes first? If the entrance is at my right hand, which is at your right hand also, okay, yeah, okay. So which is the altar to be passed through first? The altar of burnt offering, right? You, a person must pass through the burnt offering. Of course, uh, only the priest can enter within the holy, the holy place. But in any case, burnt offering comes before the altar of incense. Now, altar of incense, in case you cannot spot it, is at the holy place, just outside the curtain. Now, so what is the significance of having to pass through the burnt offering altar first before the altar of incense? Now, in order to understand the significance, we need to first remember what is the symbolism of the two altars. Do you, does anyone still remember what does this altar of burnt offering stand for? This altar of burnt offering signifies the need for sinners to be atoned for using blood, not just using anything, but using blood. Then the altar of incense, as we will share, as we will share later, the altar of incense symbolizes the prayers of God's people going up to God and also symbolizes God's acceptance of believers' prayers. Now, why do I say the incense represents believers' prayer? Just now in the responsive reading, you have read a few verses you know, where um, the Bible also symbolizes, also draw the comparison between the uh, believers' prayers and the incense that rises up to God. But what is the important thing here for us to note is a person cannot approach. Okay, now, maybe before I say this, what do you think is more, more important? Atonement comes first or prayers come first? Atonement comes first or prayer comes first? Uh, I believe you will know the standard textbook answer. So as you can see from this picture, the important thing is one cannot approach the altar of incense until the sacrifice has been made at the altar of burnt offering and until he has been washed. You know, the, there's a bronze basin, basin also beside the, okay, beside the burnt offering uh, uh, altar. So until a person sacrifices an atonement and cleanses himself, he cannot reach the altar of incense. So this gives us a very strong lesson and reminder. Uh, why? Because one thing we need to note is our prayers, human prayers, do not and cannot atone for our sins. But then why do we pray? So this is an important thing we need to note. I say again, uh, our prayers, human prayers, do not and cannot atone for our sins. No matter how, no, without the atonement that has been sacrificed, without, in our case, without Christ's atonement, no matter how fervently you come to pray to God with all your tears, with all your, zeal, all your zeal, if Christ has never done any atonement for us, no matter how much tears you have shed, it's not going to do anything to our sinful state. So our prayers do not and cannot atone for our sins. But then why do we pray? We pray to remember Jesus' sacrifice for us. We pray to remember God's atonement for us. And so, again, I say, no matter how much we pray, our prayers cannot save us. But once we receive the atonement from God, we have the privilege to pray. Why? Because once Jesus atoned for our sins, our prayers can then be accepted by God. Because before we are covered by the blood of Christ, our prayers are not cleansed before God. But when we receive the atonement of Christ, then our prayers will be acceptable to God. And so why do we pray? We pray because we are grateful to the salvation. We pray because now, on account of Christ, God will listen to our pleas. And just now, if you still recall when we read about this passage, there is this verse that says that once a year, the blood of the atoning sin offering must be applied to the horns of the altar of the incense. And that is only done once a year. Meaning, okay, 
in case you are a, a bit lost after all the short verses that you read, you know, on the altar of incense, there is no animal sacrifices, meaning to say no blood allowed. Because blood sacrifice is only done outside the, ho the holy place. It's done at the altar of the burnt offering. So at this inside, the holy place, this altar of incense, there shouldn't be any animal sacrifices. But once a year, God says you have to apply blood of the, the, the blood from the sin offering, apply it at the horns of the altar. Meaning to say, every time when the priest come to offer, offer incense, the priest will see the blood stain on the altar. And the blood stains are meant to remind the priest as they are offering the incense that, oh, God has given us this atonement. So the blood stains are served to remind the priest who are making the prayer that even when you make this prayer, this is on the basis and foundation of atonement that has been made by blood sacrifice. And so now that we see the relationship between prayer and atonement, let us consider the symbolism of incense. Since today we are talking about the altar of incense. Now, just now I mentioned, incense represents the prayers of God's people going up to God. And just now we saw from the Bible, the psalmist said, you know, may my, may my prayer be set before you like incense. And Revelation chapter 8, just now we also read that the angel, they were carrying what senses and they also have this uh, incense with the prayers of all of God's people and the smoke, the smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people were all, all went up before God. So I feel this is a very apt symbolism because just as smoke will rise, so our prayers will also rise from where we are and go to wherever God is. And so in the Old Testament, of course we know who are the ones who represent the people to offer their prayers to God. It is the priests. But we know that this Old Testament worship practice, ultimately it points to something very important. It points to Jesus Christ, our high priest and our mediator with his never ceasing intercession for us. Now, how do you feel that? How do you feel about Jesus praying for you? Uh, you know, sometimes you ask someone to pray for you. Usually, when we ask someone to pray for us, our secret hope is we want to find someone very powerful, very faithful, very spiritual, very holy. So that, you know, so usually people ask pastor to pray, you know, because we think our oh, pastor is very holy, very very spiritual. So his answers, his prayers will surely be answered by God. Usually, we don't go and ask very weak Christian or very, you know, uh, very unstable Christian to pray for us because we are also not sure whether in the first place they pray or not. But so how do you feel about Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God himself praying for you. I mean, we have been hearing this all the time. Jesus is praying for you at the right hand side of God. But I don't know, after hearing for many, many times, does it still, still touch you? But let me ask you, will Jesus' prayer not be accepted by God? Can it be possible that Jesus' prayer not be accepted by God? Of course not, right? Jesus' prayer will surely be effective. Jesus' prayer, why is it that it is our comfort and assurance that Jesus Christ himself is praying for us because we know that when Jesus prays for us, whatever he prays will be accepted by God. Whatever he prays will be effective. Because why? Because Jesus is so perfect that his perfect sacrifice can cover all our imperfection. Now, sometimes I don't know about you, you know, when we pray ourselves to God, we have this reservation about, I'm not sure whether God will listen to my prayer. I'm not sure whether God will answer my prayer because why? I know I'm not good enough to receive his answer. I know I'm not holy enough to receive his blessing. So sometimes we feel a bit um, concerned you know, whether our prayers will be heard by God. But Jesus is different. He is so perfect that his perfect sacrifice, his perfect sacrifice of atonement for all his people is perfect enough to cover all our imperfection. And Jesus is so sweet and aroma to God that his sweetness to God can cover all our stench that comes from our sin. Jesus' aroma, Jesus' sweetness can mask all the stench from our sins. So of course, it is most delightful and most assuring to have Jesus to be our perfect intercessor. So this portion of the Old Testament where we read about the Old Testament priests going into the holy place to offer incense or prayers on behalf of the people ultimately points to Jesus Christ, our perfect intercessor, praying on our behalf even today. 
But one thing we need to note, because just now, remember, I, I draw your attention to this thing about not offering strange incense to God. So as we mentioned just now, if incense symbolizes our prayers and we cannot offer strange incense to God, so meaning to say what? We also cannot pray strange prayers to God. Now, what is what, what do you mean by praying strange things to God? Have you ever prayed pray strange things to God? Of course, every time we tell believers, you can pray to God about anything, you know, just tell God everything you want. But we need to note, when the Bible gives this instruction, do not offer strange incense to God. Today, we also need to be mindful not to pray for strange things that God never asks us to pray for. In other words, do not pray for unholy things. For example, a very obvious one. Oh God, please help me strike lottery. I mean, this one is very obvious. But let's think through whether subtly or not, have you ever lift up any unauthorized or strange or unholy prayers to God? For example, can we ask God to bless our health and wealth? <laughs> Cannot ask anyone, but can we ask God to bless our Oh God, please give me wealth. Please give me health. Can we ask God to bless my studies? or my children, or my career? What do you think? Uh, it's a simple question, what? Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course can, but not because there's this wealth and health prosperity gospel, so nobody there to answer. You know, is it strange to ask God to bless us uh, for wealth and health? But we can, we can of course, pray that, but uh, by the way, it's not what I say. In case you think I've turned to a wealth and health gospel preacher or what, the Bible gave us permission by Jesus because Jesus in his Lord's prayer he what did he what did he teach we have permission to pray that God give us today our daily bread so yes we can pray for all these things but there is a danger of treading from a normal domain to a strange domain because when we pray for things we also need to be mindful that whatever we are praying is within the teachings of God so yes in the Bible there are teachings that you know just pray for the daily bread that we need but the bible also teaches us something else that we need to submit to god's will and sometimes god's will god's way is, is not the same as ours but god says my way is higher than your way so the bible also teaches yes you can ask but it will be very strange and very unholy to demand that god must give whatever i ask to me so yes, it's okay to ask because sometimes we also don't know whether it's okay you know, to ask for this job, whether it's okay to ask for this thing. We can ask, but when God didn't give us, the Bible also teaches us that we need to submit and trust that his way, his way is higher and better than my way. So yes, we must pray within the boundaries and the teachings that God has given us. So let's pray that we, our prayers is not to God a strange incense but a sweet aroma so if our prayers were to be a sweet aroma to god then it must be aligned with god's desire and it must be aligned to god's teachings and characters and so if that's the case then how can you how can we pray better prayer how can we pray more correct prayer that is the more correct knowledge we have of god the more correct our prayer will be and the more god pleasing our prayer will be so incense re represents our prayers and incense also represents another thing incense also represents the presence of god so just now i mentioned you know incense uh, symbolizes believers prayers being lifted up to god but it also represents that you know god he accepts that prayer and if you recall, incense will, incense will almost all the time pro, uh, uh, lead to smoke, right? So smoke will always come from incense. And smoke will bring to our mind when God led the Israelite out of Egypt. God represents himself through a pillar of uh, fire and cloud. And so smoke in the Bible have this representation because humans cannot see God. You know, you cannot see God in his entirety. So uh, when there is this smoke, it also represents that God's presence is there with his people and God's presence is there to accept the prayers of his people. 
and God is drawing near to meet his people. So that is the symbolism and significance of this altar of incense. Now, the next thing that we're going to read about, about how we can be pleasing to God, is this thing called atonement money. Uh, now, when you talk about atonement and money, this this subheading, by the way, this, this heading doesn't come from me. Uh. This is the NIV Bible uh, subheading. So when you read about atonement money, you feel very strange. This is some her heretic sounding you know, teaching. But let's read the verses first to understand what this whole section is all about. So the other thing to make ourselves acceptable to God is this atonement money. In that, or another name for this is ransom. Okay, we will look at Exodus chapter 30, verse 11 onwards. Then the Lord said to Moses, When you take a census of the Israelites to count them, each one must pay the Lord a ransom for his life at the time he is counted. Then no plague will come on them when you number them. Now, since you talk about census and talk about you know, uh, uh, being uh, struck with a plague and so on, uh, we want, I want to share uh, this potential danger in the Old Testament, potential danger associated with taking a censor. Because if those of you who read the Bible, you'll recall a, a, an incident where David, so in First Chronicles chapter 21, David was punished. Israelites also was struck with plague. Why? Because King David go and itchy hand want to take a census. And that story back in the, uh, not back, I mean that story in First Chronicles chapter 21 tells us that it is dangerous to take census because many a times, Senses actually arose from human pride. You know, you want to count, you know, David that time want to count how strong his military force is. So many a times taking senses is due to a lot of uh, human sinful desire. And in ancient times, in case we are not aware, in ancient times, senses are taken for two key reasons. One is to take a count so that you can prepare yourself for war. Because if, if you want to go for a war, you need to count how many soldiers you have. Second, um, main purpose for taking a census in the ancient time is when you want to impose a tax. Now you want to count how many people can contribute tax to the country. And so for Israel, because they are the people of God, they are not their own people. They are not supposed to rule themselves. They are supposed to submit to the kingship and the lordship of God. So the Israelites are not supposed, they have no right to decide about going to war or uh, even the kings of Israel, they have no right to decide uh, whether they want to impose tax unless the Lord instructed them or oh, go and go to this battle or go to that bat battle. So generally taking a census um, is associated with disobedience to God. So that's why God needs to have this warning. But here we see that God offered a way for the people to be unharmed even if a censor was taken. Now verse 13, so what's the way that God has provided? That is to pay the ransom. Verse 13 each one who crosses over to those already counted is to give half, give a half shekel according to the century shekel, which weighs 20 jaras. This half shekel is an offering to the Lord. Now, if you pay attention, it is not just any shekel. It's not just any money, but it is the century shekel. Century shekel, what does it bring to your mind? It's something holy, something set apart for God. Now, so it means to say that the kind of redemption price that God demands must be what he specified. It is not, any, it is not that any kind of payment qualifies to be the redemption price. So in today's gospel context, it means to say that the, the ransom or the redemption price that God demands for sinner's life is not any price, but it must be the price of Jesus blood because only Jesus' blood is good enough, not anything else, not just any other blood, not just anybody's sacrifice, but only Jesus' sacrifice is good enough to redeem sinners. And then verse 14, all who cross over those 20 years old or more are to give an offering to the Lord. And important, the one interesting thing is in verse 15, the rich are not to give more than, than a half shekel and the poor are not to give less when you make the offering to the Lord to atone for your lives. Then verse 16, it tells us what is the purpose for the, in this case, what's the purpose of this atonement money. Receive the atonement money from the Israelites and use it for the service of the tent of meeting, meaning to support the tabernacle. 
and it will be a memorial for the Israelites before the Lord, making atonements for your life. So memor- this word memorial, it suggests that this atonement money is related to remembering something. Okay, so now, just now I mentioned, even after reading this whole passage, how many of you feel the, the subheading atonement money? By the way, it's also not just NIV subtitle. It's also mentioned in the Bible, verse 16, atonement money. Now, when you read about this atonement money, I'm sure it sounds strange to us. Because why? The idea of this atonement money will bring to our mind this concept of the Roman Catholic of what? I mean, I don't know how many of you have been Roman Catholics before you become a Christian, but this concept of uh, atonement money may sound like the Roman Catholics' idea of buying indulgence. No, for Roman Catholics, they buy indulgence for what? They buy indulgence to... So they, they pay to buy indulgence to reduce or to eliminate punishment for their sins. Now, of course, we Christians, I need to put it on record, huh? we Christians, we do not believe in that. We do not believe in buying a, indulgence to eliminate or to reduce our, uh, our penalty for sins. Because we all know, right, we, we surely cannot buy atonement with our money. I say again, we cannot buy atonement with our money. We cannot earn our atonement with material things. I mean, even if we are not talking about material things, the Bible is very clear. You cannot even earn salvation with your good deeds, much less material things. So that's very clear. But if that's clear, then the question will come to our minds to, to ask. So why then did God command the giving of atonement money? What, has, what lesson has it for us? I mean, if Surely we know we cannot earn our salvation. Surely we know we cannot earn atonement by money or even with our good deeds. Then why did God com- command this in the Old Testament? So here the point is, we need to note very carefully, the, the emphasis here is what? The point here is not that money can buy atonement, but that what? But that giving of the atonement money, meaning to, the giving of the ransom to God, was in fact an act to acknowledge God's atonement for us. I I say again, the people there, they were not commanded to pay the atonement money to buy their atonement, but to remember God's atonement of them. So they pay the ransom, not because they have the means to redeem themselves, but they pay the ransom to God to remember that God was the one who had ransomed them. So that's why just now in verse 16 you read that by so doing, it will be a memorial for the Israelites before the Lord. So when God asked the Israelites to pay him that ransom, it is actually for them to remember, hey, you know, you actually belong to me. You actually, your life belongs to me. And so when we talk about, when we talk about, uh, of course, just now in the Bible, verse 16, we also read about the practical um, purpose of collecting this atonement money because God says, practically, this atonement money is to use to support the tent of meeting. It's used because you need materials to build the tabernacle and so on. So there is this practical aspect of the money. But still, what is of deeper significance is the spiritual, spiritual meaning. And so, just now I mentioned the Israelites were commanded to pay a ransom for their life. So what does it mean to pay this ransom for this this person's life? Now, when this ransom is paid to God, there is this symbolic meaning. It means that by right, by right, uh, God owns their life. Now, by right, if God owns a life, if something is to offer to God, now in the Old Testament, if something is to be offered to God, whether it's a lamb, whether it's a ram, whatever, what happens to the animal? The animal must die, right? Killed, slaughtered, sacrificed on the altar. Of course, God is not going to do, do that to humans, right? So, so here, but the idea is symbolic, meaning to say, when the people is commanded to pay God a ransom, they are supposed to remember that symbolically, by right, God owns their life and he has the right to make them lose their life. But God graciously gives the person's life back to him so that he can continue to live, to enjoy the covenant blessings that God has prepared for his people. So in fact, 
This idea of atonement money is similar to the idea of redemption. Maybe I use another verse to explain so that maybe it's easier for you to understand. If you recall in Exodus chapter 13, we also read about this um, redemption practice. So let's look at Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13 verse 13 here, it says, Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. Okay, so here the background is, we have explained this before, but in case you've forgotten, what he's saying here is, by right, all the firstborns of Israel, whether it's human, whether it's animal, all the firstborn of Israel by right belongs to God. And what is the context of that? Because if you still recall uh, the Passover event, you know, where uh, before the Israelites left Egypt, God sent his destroying angels to kill all the firstborns of the Egyptian, right? But God passed over who? God passed over all the Israelite household. While every other Egyptian household, they were wailing because their firstborn animal and their sons, they were dead. The Israelites were kept safe because the Israelites' animals and firstborn sons, they were all uh, protected and spared. And after that event, God told the Israelites, because of this, remember the Passover. So because of this, you are to consecrate, if you read the Bible, uh, the, God clearly tells the Israelites, you are to consecrate your every firstborn not just your sons, but even your animals to me. But then you just imagine if an Israelite, wow, God, I'm supposed to sacrifice my firstborn to you. Does it mean that I have to kill them and slaughter them on the altar and offer to God? Of course, God is not a cruel, crazy God. I mean, of course, and God is a merciful God. He knows that the Israelites, they care for their firstborn sons. Surely the Israelites wouldn't want their firstborn sons to die. So God offer a way out that if you don't want your firstborn sons to die, but still acknowledging that the life of your firstborn sons, in fact, still belong to me. Same thing applies for your livestock, the more expensive livestock like the don donkey. The way to do it is you redeem for each of your, you, you redeem for your sons something else, you know, use a substitute to redeem so that whatever is treasured by you, the firstborn sons or your more expensive livestock gets to live. But the act of having this redemption or uh, redeeming with a lamb, that this act itself serves to remind the person, I still have my firstborn son with me, but he actually don't belong to me. He belongs to God. And God, in his mercy, allow him to live so that I can use something else to redeem for my firstborn son. But, but the logic is still the same. Even though the, this person is still alive, the firstborn son, the life and ownership belongs to God. So the same logic applies here for this case when we talk about the atonement money. Just now we read, someone, an Israelite, 20 years old and above, they are to pay God this ransom. Meaning to say, by right, God owns, God owns the life of every Israelite, 20 years old and above. In fact, God owns every, every person's life. But God is trying to say, every Israelite, 20 years old and above, by right, their life belongs to me. I can do anything I want with them. But now, in order for you to acknowledge that your life is your life belongs to me and you still can carry on living, you have to pay the ransom. So here, how does the Israelite, um, how does the Israelite signify or acknowledge that he agree with God's, um, God's thinking that, yes, God, I truly belong to you. My life belongs to you. How, how can this Israelite show his agreement with God? He shows it by practically paying God that ransom price. So I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. And this whole analogy, this whole practice, in fact, ultimately points us to the ransom paid by Christ to redeem our lives from God. Because in the same way, by right, all of us should have died because of our sins. But because Jesus Christ used his life to redeem for us, and so we are still living now and eternal, eternally. And so just now we read also in the responsive reading that Jesus has given his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus died as a ransom to set people free from sins. So that is a very important concept. Uh, we cannot buy atonement with money, but the act of paying God this ransom is to remember that, in fact, our lives belong to God. But there's one more noteworthy point about this atonement money, this ransom. Just now, if you recall, um, in fact, this ransom money 
or this atonement money is not proportional to a person's wealth status. Because just now in verse 15, it clearly states this thing. The rich are not to give more and the poor are not to give less. Why? Now, I don't know, those of you who are very rich, wow, see this verse, very happy. Well, the rich are not to give more. Wow, okay, everybody give $1, I also give $1, even though I, owe, I earn $1 million. I mean, okay, by the way, this, this, you must understand, the context is in relation to atonement. It's not talking about tithes and offering, uh, because elsewhere in the Bible, God really talked about giving a tenth. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, God talked about giving a tenth to God. So there is a portion of teaching where it's proportional to the wealth. But here, as far as atonement is concerned, God gave us this instruction. The rich are not to give more, the poor are not to give less. Why? We have to ask why. But I think the, the reason is very simple, right? Uh, all of you will have guessed the reason why. Why in terms of atonement money, the rich is not to give more, the, the poor is not to give less? It is because everyone, whether you are rich or poor, you are equally a sinner in the eyes of God. It doesn't mean that the rich, uh, just because you are rich, you are less of a sinner. Oh, no, no, sorry. doesn't mean if you are poor, you are less of a sinner, so you give less money. doesn't mean if you are rich, then you give more because you are more sinful. No. Everyone is equally a sinner before God. Whether you are accomplished in life or you are a failure in life, whether in, even if you are a preacher or you are a lay person, same. Everyone is equally sinful. All of us are equal sinners in need of forgiveness and atonement. No one deserves special favor from God. So the rich, in other words, the rich cannot use their money uh, to bribe God. And God, you know, just can you just save me? Let me give me a book, me a place, reserve me a place in heaven. I pay you more money. The rich cannot just have favor from God to earn God's favor with their money. And the poor also cannot play the sympathy card or score sympathy point. And God, you know, look at me, I'm so I'm so charm, I'm so miserable in this life. Can you just spare me a spot in heaven? The, the poor cannot say that to God, you know. Uh, God, please take pity on me, you know, I'm so poor. You just forgive me of all my sins. No, whether you're the rich, whether you're the poor, the redemption price that God will accept for everyone, anyone, is the same. And what is that same redemption price? Of course, we know. That is Jesus Christ's blood. Nothing more, nothing less. This is something very important. This is a very important um, biblical con gospel concept. The redemption price that God is willing to accept for every sinner, whether you are rich or poor, smart or not smart, is the same. It's Jesus Christ's blood. Again, I say, nothing more, nothing less. So if you add something else to Jesus' blood, yes, you know, some people say, oh, I also have Jesus Christ's blood. But if you add something else to Jesus Christ's blood, maybe it's money, maybe it's talent, maybe it's hours of serving, maybe it's good works. If you add something else to Jesus', Jesus blood and you claim that because of Jesus' blood, plus my good work, plus my money, plus my hours of Bible reading, and therefore I'm safe, God is not going to accept that ransom price. It cannot be more than Jesus' blood because nothing, Jesus' blood suffice. You, you cannot add to that price. Or if we offer something less perfect than Jesus' blood, uh, and say, God, can you don't be so calculative? You know, I know I'm not so holy like Jesus, but I'm trying my best to live a holy life. Can you just accept my good deeds and on account of my good deeds, just forgive my sins? God will definitely not accept anything lesser, less perfect than Jesus', Jesus blood. So again, I say, as far as redemption, atonement is concerned, the redemption price that God is willing to accept is the same for everyone. And that price is Jesus Christ. And so, actually, the truth is, by right, we should have died. But because of the ransom that Jesus paid, we all get to live. And since Jesus has paid the ransom for us, now we are God's people, we are God's children, but at the same time, we are also God's what? We are God's people, we are God's children, we are very happy about this status. But at the same time, we are also God's servant. And God is to be our King, our Father, and our Lord. And we pray that while we are very thankful and happy to receive the ransom of Christ, we pray that we truly treat Jesus as King and Lord and Father that we honor in our life. Not just happily collect God's redemption grace very happily, but didn't acknowledge Him as our King in our decision, our actions, our life. No. 
We are redeemed by God, and He is our Father and our King. Now, another thing about this atonement money is what? This atonement money, very important, is the Bible is very clear. The atonement money collected was not collected collectively, meaning to say, God didn't say, oh, this household of person A and this household of person B, each household give me $10. No. God says, every Israelite, every person, age 20 and above. So meaning to say, it again reminds us of the important principle of salvation, that salvation must be received personally by faith. Salvation doesn't come tied with family line or birth. So it doesn't mean that you're birthed into this Christian family, then you're automatically saved because your parents are Christians. Because we all know even the descendants of Abraham, not every descendant of Abraham is, uh, not every one of them belong to God's covenant. So in the same way, today, if any one of us, I think there's many of us who come from uh, Christian families, if you are from a Christian family, and up to today, you have not given your salvation serious thought. I think it's time to do so because the Bible keeps reminding us that salvation is personal, it's individual, it doesn't come with the family. And so each person must receive God's gift of salvation humbly and individually. Now, so that's about the atonement money. Uh, and it gives us, it summarizes for us important um, truths concerning atonement. Now, the next few, the next two things will be very fast because they are more straightforward. So the next item, we have four items to look at today. So, so just now I, I, we talk about the altar of incense. Then just now we talk about atonement money. Next is about the basin for wa washing. Okay, this will be very fast. Exodus chapter 30, verse 17 onwards. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. Now, why do I say it's very quick, the explanation? Because it's quite obvious. Uh, why it is important for us to cleanse ourselves when we approach God. Now, just now you notice, when we read that short passage, the priests only wash which part of their body? Did they have a full shower? No. They only wash their hands and feet, meaning to say they wouldn't be completely, totally, physically clean by just washing their hands and their feet. So this is meant to be a ceremonial kind of cleansing. It's not a full shower, but the ceremonial cleansing has with it important significance, meaning to say that the act of washing is a humble acknowledgement that God, I'm a sinner who is not perfect to stand before you. When I approach you, I need to be careful to cleanse myself. So it's not cleansing the whole thing as if going for a full shower, but the symbolic action of acknowledging to God that every time when we come before God, we need to be mindful to cleanse ourselves. So this is something that we need to note also today. Even though we are have been, even though we have been redeemed by Christ's blood, every day we are polluted by sinful thoughts, worldly temptation, by selfish desires. So every time when we come before God, when we when we are about to face this holy God who can see through the deepest thought within our heart, we need to pray once again, God, I know I'm not up to your standard. But please remember Jesus' blood and cleanse, Jesus, cleanse me with Jesus' blood again so that I can be acceptable to you. So this is something I, I believe most sinners who are redeemed Christians, it's not, it's not difficult for us to understand this. And since we have covered a lot about consecration and washing in the last Exodus um, sermon, if you recall, we talked about washing, consecration. So I'll not talk too much on that today. But the idea is still important. We need to cleanse our heart, not just outside. We need to cleanse our hearts, our mind when we come before God. And we cannot cleanse ourselves. We need to ask Holy Spirit to cleanse us, purify our hearts and minds. We need to cleanse ourselves with Jesus Christ's blood. And finally, we'll talk about this last portion that is about the anointing oil and incense. The last portion of Exodus 30, verse 25. 
Okay, here, make this. Now, I didn't read everything, but make this. The this refers to the fine spices in the few verses above. Fine spices like myrrh, cinnamon, and so on. So make this fine spices into sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blend, the work of a perfumer. It will be the sacred anointing oil, then use it to anoint the tent of meeting, the Ark of the Covenant Law, the table and all its articles, the lampstands and its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, and the basin with its stand. You shall consecrate them so they will be most holy and whatever touches them will be holy. So to anoint all these items uh, means to what? Set them apart for God. And at verse 30, anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them so that they may serve me as priests. Say to the Israelites, this is to be my sacred anointing oil for the generations to come. And verse 30, verse 32, sorry, do not pour it on anyone's anyone else's body and do not make any other oil using the same formula. The next phrase is important. It is sacred and you are to consider it sacred. God views whatever is holy in his eyes very seriously. When God deems something as sacred and we defile that, it carries consequence, very dreadful consequences. Verse 33, whoever makes perfume like it and puts it on anyone other than a priest must be cut off from their people. Verse 34, then the Lord said to Moses, take fragrant spices, gum resin, onica, and galbana, and pure friend incense, all in equal amounts, and make a fragrant blend of incense. So just now it's talking about oil, now it's about incense. The work of a perfumer. It, it is to be sorted and pure and sacred. Grind some of it to powder and place it in front of the altar of the covenant law in the tent of the meeting where I will meet you. So God keep telling, reminding, if you do things right, will I not meet you? If you do things right, if you please me, will I not be near to you? So today we may not have this elaborate tabernacle, but God is also telling us the same thing. If you follow my instruction, if you do what I tell you to do, if you set what is holy as holy, if you set what is supposed to be consecrated, consecrated time, consecrated talents, consecrated heart and mind, if you do everything according to what I tell you, wouldn't I meet you in your heart? When I draw near to you and give you peace, I will. And so here, where I will meet with you, it shall be most holy to you. Verse 33, do not make an, any incense with this formula for yourself. So it's repeated, similar commandment as what is commanded for the oil. So do not make this formula uh, for yourself. Consider it holy to the Lord. Whoever makes incense like it to enjoy its fragrance must be cut off from their people. So here we see there's a strong distinction between what is sacred and profane. Another word for profane, another meaning for profane is common. So there is a strong distinction between what is sacred and what is common use of the oil and incense. In other words, God treats what is set apart for him very seriously. And so what belongs to God cannot be used for common use. So who, what else belongs to God? It's not just the oil, the incense. What is one important thing that belongs to God? You and my life. You and my time. Our heart, our thoughts, our focus, our energy, everything of our life belongs to God. When God considers it, it as sacred, it is also our duty not to defile it, not to defile our body, not to defile our heart and mind, not to defile our ways, our time. So God views whatever is sacred to him as holy, meaning to say what belongs to God can only be sacred and not lose its holiness. And that applies to us as his holy people. And so this chapter, when you talk about oil and incense, it's not just talking about setting apart. It's, it's telling us that people who are set or whatever is set apart from God, uh, whatever is set apart for God, whether it's people or item, is supposed to smell nice. I don't know today if you, you smell nice or not. <laughs> I mean to God. So whatever, I mean God, he delights in holy things. He delights in sweet things. He delights in beautiful things. When we belong to God, we cannot be smelly and defiled and unholy. So even, you just think about it, even the oil, even the incense, even the table, even the altar, even the tent of meeting, even the objects needs to smell nice. How much more ourselves, life, people who belong to God. So when God set us 
apart as his holy people, he wanted us to give out the fragrance of Christ because we are not fragrant by ourselves. We can only smell nice when we carry the smell of Jesus Christ. So 2 Corinthians just now we read, but let's look at it again. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession. So the captive, this word sounds bad, nah, like we are captives, but we are captured by God. We are won over by God to belong to Christ's procession. And God uses us to spread the what? Spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ. So we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ. Without Christ, we are not, we, we are not fragrant. And we are the pleasing aroma of Christ among who? Among those who are being saved and those perishing. Verse 16, to the one we are aroma that brings death to the other and aro an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Now, aroma that brings death sounds a bit strange. But in the Bible, in fact, I mean in the root word, aroma is actually uh, supposed to be, in the root word, is a very neutral um, word. It could be smell. You know, smell can be nice smell, bad smell. It can be odor. So it's uh, good or bad. So the question for us to ponder or the thing for us to pray about is, God has made it clear that we are supposed to be a sweet aroma to God and a pleasing living sacrifice to God, as we often read in Romans chapter 12. And so the truth is we need to remember that God's anointed people. How do you know who is anointed by God? Whether God anoint us with the Holy Spirit, in the past God anointed his people with the anointing oil, God's anointed people are marked out, distinguished by how we smell. Because we are, in fact, displaying to the rest of the world, we are displaying Christ. When we go to our office, when we go to our neighborhood, when we live in our non-believing family, even when we live in a Christian household, we are displaying Christ to everyone around us. And in particular, in this verse, God wants us to spread what kind of aroma? The aroma of the knowledge of God to people around us, telling people about the good news of Jesus, telling people about the wonderful grace of Jesus, letting people know God for who he is. Now, we need to understand that smell can have two effects, right? Smell can have two effects, right? If it's a foul smell, uh, who likes foul smell? I mean, <laughs> who likes uh, to always be very near foul smell? But foul smell can be useful to a certain extent. Why? Foul smell is a warning. It is, um, of course, foul smell, foul smell repels people, but it can also warn people. It warns people of what? It warns people, for example, of something toxic. Why is this pungent, strange smell? Something toxic. So what is toxic in our spiritual walk? Sin is toxic. You know, when God's knowledge, when the aroma of God's, uh, when the aroma of Christ comes, he's so holy, but when you know what is holy, you naturally know what is um, sin because you contrast it with holiness. So smell, foul smell can warn people of toxic, of something rotten, like death is approaching. Or it can also warn people of something dangerous. Uh, you know, if you smell smoke, you know, if you smell something burning in your house, I think you'll be very worried and walk around your house to, to see where is the smoking uh, smell coming from, right? So Foul smell can also be a warning. It can warn people of God's coming wrath. That if you don't repent soon, wrath of God will come upon sinner soon. But then on the other, so foul smell has its purpose, but it's also, it's, it's repelling, re repulsive, but it's also a warning. And smell can also be fragrant. Uh, fragrant is something that attracts people. You know, When we are fragrant smell, we attract people to the goodness, to the love, to the grace, to the knowledge of God. Now, so, in the same way, because smell can work both ways. And so just now you read in the Bible, it can be aroma to one group that brings death, aroma to another group that brings life. Because there are always two responses to the gospel, to the aroma of Christ. Because to some people, Christ himself and Christ's gospel sounds like a stench. You know, I don't like this. You know, it's interfering in my life. I don't like this. You're talking about death. I don't want to, talk, I don't want to think about death. So to some people, it's a stench, Christ. But to some people, elected by God, Christ's gospel is a fragrance because this is exactly the answer I need in my life. This is exactly the assurance I need. I've been looking for, for eternal assurance. So whatever people's responses are, God tells us to be 
the pleasing aroma of Christ to everyone around us. And so the question, again, I say, we need to ponder is, how do we smell today? To God, how do we smell? To others, how do we smell? Can other people smell the fragrance of Christ from us? Or they only smell the, the flavor of gossip, selfishness, anger, uh, calculativeness, or whatever. You know, when people smell us, they say, oh, this stingy person is coming. Or when people smell us, they say, oh, this uh, troublemaker is coming. I mean, what do people smell, you know, when, they, when we go into their midst? This is something we need to ponder. But again, I said, even if, even if we do give out the fragrance of Christ, the Bible already tells us, even if you are really giving out the fragrance of Christ, to some people, it will still be a stench like death. But to some people else, it will be an aroma. So what matters most is what? What matters most is still not what people think about us, but what matters most is to God, are we a fragrant aroma? And so this is something we need to keep thinking and working out for the rest of the year. And we pray that God, who began the good work in us, will continue his good sanctifying work in us so that we can be a sweeter and nicer aroma to God in Christ. So with this, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for giving us your word. Not many a times, the Old Testament, especially the sacrificial system and temple system, may, sound, may feel very abstract to us living in this modern world. But Lord, we thank you because you are consistent and coherent God. Even when we talk about uh, very ancient practices, Lord, we know it linked to your never-changing principle of atonement, of grace, of whatever is pleasing to you. So God, we pray that we will take your word to heart. And God, even though it's not so easy to constantly give out the aroma, the fragrance of Christ, Lord, we are willing and we pray that the Holy Spirit work in us so that um, through us and through knowing you better, Indeed, you can use our life to send out the fragrance of Christ, to touch people around us, to attract them to you. Lord, we ourselves cannot do this on our own, but we know you are uh, faithful to continue this work in us. So we thank you and we pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.